Welcome back to Tech Notes. In this video, I do want to talk about some airside diagnostics, and I'd like to talk about, um, give some examples as we go through those. Now, airside diagnostics are one of the most often missed things for a lot of technicians, and it can have some ex pretty extreme consequences. What do we mean by airside? Anything that has to do with air distribution, like ductwork, coils, pressure drops, filters, fans and blowers, grills, and registers. Those are all airside diagnostics. There's a lot of problems that airside diagnostics can address. Things like lack of dehumidification, lack of filtration, lack of cooling, hot and cold areas inside a house, high energy bills, frequent breakdowns, and also, believe it or not, condensate drainage issues. We'll talk more about that. Many airside problems are missed while technicians try to fix equipment problems that do not exist. By equipment, I mean like the air handler, the furnace, or the condenser. But a lot of times these problems are airside, which would include all the duct work and everything that occurs within duct work, as well as pressures. No matter how many parts are changed out, including full systems, the airside problems may still exist because of not, the duct work is not always replaced with the system. This can lead to customer dis dissatisfaction, loss of profits for contractors due to callbacks and lost customers. So airside diagnosis can affect your business. There's also some legal liability. Misdiagnosis can lead to legal liabilities for both the contractor and a licensed technician personally. Do not skip checking airside performance in your diagnosis procedures because I promise you, the evaluation that the insurance company or the lawyer does will check airside diagnosis. They will perform airside checks. Step one is always the same. We start off with, is the equipment running properly? What are the amperages? Are the coils clean? What are the refrigerant temperatures? What are the pressures? Does everything add up? Okay, we can do that. We take pictures, we go in and we can take readings that also follow time. What you're seeing here is the Testo set of tools. Okay, we take amperages, compressor and fan. That's our outdoor unit. We look at the coils. You look at the coil back here in this picture on the right, you'll see that it's actually dirty. Then we go inside, we take a look at the temperature splits. We take our supply dry bulb temperature, our return dry bulb temperature. We make sure we have a wet bulb of each as well, or the humidity. We compare it to a standard chart. Take a look at them. Is it too high or too low? Once again, just standard dry bulb temperatures does not give you everything you need. Okay, yeah, I have an 18.3 degree temperature split here, but is it right or wrong? Ah, you don't have enough information. Now, if I take and I find my return air dry bulb, my return air wet bulb, and my supply air temperature, now I have enough information because I can take and compare it to a temperature chart where I find my return air dry bulb, 76 degrees. I find my return air wet bulb, if I remember right, going back a slide, that was, six, let's say, 67 degrees on that. It was actually 78 degrees there. Okay, so we take 67. We see where those columns meet. It's calling for 17.2. Wait a sec. I had an 18.3. So in the grand scheme of things, my temperature difference, the temperature split, is too high. Okay, now, I know the answer to this because I'm the one who evaluated the system, but if the temperature split is too low, we have poor system performance. We could have high air velocity, in other words, it's moving across the coil too fast, which could lead to a leaking supply duct. Okay, if it's too high, which is where we're at, we have a low airflow. The longer the air sits on the evaporator coil, the colder it's going to get. Another thing you can look at is, as you look at airflow, if you see condensation on the bottom or the sides of the air handler. This is an air handler where it's actually dripping 
water, and it's not because it's leaking. Okay, condensation on the bottom or sides of air handler is a typical sign of low airflow. Think about the glass of ice water sitting on a kitchen counter in a humid room. Think about how much condensation occurs on the outside of the glass. Well, if I have an air handler that's too cold because of lack of airflow, okay, no matter how much insulation is in that air handler, I'm going to get condensation if it's in a humid environment. For example, in an attic in Florida or a garage in Florida. Now we want to take static supply pressures, static return pressure, and then we add the absolute value. By static pressure, okay, it's the outward pressure. It's not velocity pressure. It's not the pressure of the air moving. It's the outward pressure on the ductwork. Then we drop the signs because our supply is going to be positive. Return is going to be negative. We drop the sign and we add them together. Then we want to compare that to the data plate on the air handler. Here's an example. Return below the coil above the filter. 0.46. I'm ignoring the negative because we all know return is going to be negative. Supply, same unit, over the coil, 0.16. And it was also taken in a number of different places with the same reading, basically. So we take these together, 0 0.46, 0 0.16, we come up with a 0.62, okay, static pressure, okay? Because you take your 0.46, your 0.16, add them together. 6 and 6 is 12, carry the 1, so we get a 0.62, okay? Then we compare that to the data plate where there's a test static pressure rating, which is your design static pressure, for the unit. This is a 0.4. My static pressure is too high. Then we compare the supply and return. Okay. Again, remember my return was a 0.46. My supply was a 0.16. Is one significantly higher than the other? Yeah, it is. Okay, my supply static is significant, or my return static, which is the 0.46, is significantly higher than the supply. Okay, then we can go and find out what part of our problem is. That's the side you want to concentrate on first. Okay, in this case, the blower is pulling a very high suction pressure, but not putting much into the supply duct work. Okay. Now, if you don't find anything else wrong with the return, you will have to look at the supply because it could have a big gaping hole in the supply duct. But not with those temperature splits we saw. The temperature splits is too high, not enough airflow. Then we want to go measure the main trunk lines. Measure the diameter, if round, or the dimensions, if rectangular, of the main trunk lines, both the supply and return. Then you want to calculate the airflow each can support. Many high-end co companies use the constant pressure method or this a pressure method for duct design. In other words, the pressure drop is going to be equivalent through the entire system. Mo most of us use 0.1 inches water column per 100 feet for the supply, 0.08 inch water column per 100 feet equivalent for the return. Now, be careful here. This is not 100 feet of ductwork. You're going to say, well, I only have 50 feet of ductwork on the house. No, it's the equivalent. It takes into account, and this is a topic for another conversation, any 90-degree elbow. If you have a 90-degree elbow, that could equal 25 feet of ductwork. Okay, so again, it's the equivalent. So again, we use 0.1-inch water column for supply, 0.08-inch for return. Why do we use lower for return? Because of filters, okay, for efficiency of filters. This is a part of a duct layer. So if I have a 14-inch round, which is my number right there, and if I want a return of 0.08, which is my line right there, this piece of ductwork, 14-inch round, can handle 900 cubic feet per minute of air, okay? The supply will be slightly higher because I'm going to use a higher static pressure. I'm going to use a higher friction loss or pressure difference. 
I'll give a 0.1. That would be a thousand. So again, depending on what your design pressure drop is, is where you're going to get your number from. Now, why does static pressure? Why does it matter? Okay, how much CFM I'm handling? Because I have to have 400 CFM of air per ton of air conditioning. Okay, so if I have a four-ton system, I have to be my stat. My CFM has to be up in this range. I have to have 1,600 CFM of air. Now, if this was the only return, I know I have a shortage right there. Okay, another type of calculator. Again, you have your 14-inch round. Now, if you have rectangular. You can also use the slide rule. You use your large dimension. Let's say it's 20. Your small, your small dimension, okay, in this case would be like 12. So this would be a 20 by 12 duct equals a 14 inch round. And again, based on whatever static pressure I'm gonna use, if it's a 0.8, I'm about 900 CFM. If it's a 0.1, this ductulator is showing it a little bit over 1,000. There's a little bit of a difference between the different ductulators, but it still gets the point across. Velocity, okay, is the speed of the air moving. We're also concerned about velocity. So if I have a velocity pressure, and the velocity pressure takes the actual fan into account, takes the movement of air, okay, you can figure out how fast things are based on the CFM of the duct. We measure the velocity in both the supply and the return ducts. We want to compare this against the standards. For most residential environments, I want 700 CF or 700 feet per minute in my main ductwork, or 900 for round ductwork. Office areas, 2,200 in rectangular ductwork, 2,400 in round. Now there's a note on here. Be very careful. Depending on the type of office, for example, medical or dental, it may have been designed as residential because the higher the velocity, the higher the drafts and the higher the noise. So again, same system we have been talking about. Took a couple readings, be any place between 1,400 and 1,500 feet per minute. That's a problem. It's too fast for residential. Too high of a velocity. Find the problem is your final step. Using what you've learned from the static pressures, the airflow calculations, and the velocities, find the problem. Most of the troubleshooting from this point is a matter of following the duct work from the air handler on out for the supply side or from the return back to the air handler. Don't overlook anything. Don't skip portions of duct work because you're liable to find a leak. One of the issues is kink duct work. Okay, if you look closely at this picture here, you'll see that they pulled it below a, stu a joist and clamped it between the ceiling and the joist. Okay, this is a suspended ceiling. So whoever put the suspended ceiling up, clamped that ductwork in there. It's cut the ductwork flow to about a third of what it's supposed to be. Okay, crushed ductwork. Flex duct can't have this crushed area here, because inside that, that restricts airflow. Flex duct is supposed to be pulled tight and supported. It's not supposed to be kink crushed and bent like this. Restricted filters, undersized filter grills. Looking at this filter without even pulling the filter out of here, you can see the dirt pattern where the, the boot is, okay? This is only an eight inch round on a three ton system. Okay, no way is it gonna have enough airflow. Then if it's tough to see on the video, but if you look up in here, this flex duct is coming off of here and going directly to the left of the picture. There's a, they're trying to make a 90 degree elbow out if you're just using flex duct, it's going to collapse. Solution, bigger boot, and using a 90 degree metal and then going to flex. Document everything with pictures if possible. Record all your readings, even if everything is good. Documentation is an important reference for the future. Okay, and for those who know what the initial CYA stands for, okay, 
comes down to covering yourself in case of future liability. Document everything. Use pictures, record all your readings, even if everything's good. If I don't find a temp split problem and I don't find a static pressure problem, okay, as a part of a preventative maintenance, I'm really not going to go that much further other than checking for filters um, because my airflow is good. But as soon as I find a problem, I got to find out why there's a problem. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, please subscribe. There's a little subscription button on here, and it's extremely important for those of us on YouTube that you subscribe to our channels. Thank you.